So hello, it's Paul here from Shrimpers Cast, and I've been joined today by a very special guest. Really looking forward to this interview. I'm being joined with Liam Ager from the Shrimp Trust, and he's the co-editor at All at Sea Fanzine. Hello, Liam. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much for having us on. How are you? Very well, thank you. Enjoy my uh, end to my working week. It's uh, the weekend's here. I'm looking forward to filed tomorrow for another positive result. And uh, so how's your week been? All good? Yeah, very. I'm very excited about Fylde as well. I think the pick me up of Tuesday night was what we all needed. Um, the home form has been really good. Fylde minus ten goal difference after ten games. You know, um, th- this is Southend United we're talking about. So never discount the possibility of losing five 0 to the team at the bottom of the table. But um, I'm I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Really am. Yeah, same here. We were there at Tuesday and. Um... What a great, well, the game was just incredible. Mooney was outstanding in the first half and then it kind of switched. Everything was going down the other side with Bridge and uh, Big Wes. I mean, what a goal from Wes. Gazza would have loved that, wouldn't he? That double <laughs> nutmeg into the box, curl it off the post. Oh, absolutely superb. But I yeah, thought Jack, hope... Sorry? I thought Jack Wood had a really good game as well, actually. Oh. His ability to hit the ground running and really link up the final third. We've been looking for a player to sort of dance around people and thread through balls through and sort of do that and sort of make those connections moving into the final third. We've been looking for someone like that for a long time and and he looks a hell of a player. He does indeed. I mean, he got the penalty and he was just, again, so positive, full of energy. And he's, uh, you know, for a young lad coming into a team in a club in crisis, he's dropped in perfectly, really, I thought. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, Liam, what um, is your involvement then with the Shrimpers Trust? So I, I was co-opted onto the board of the Shrimpers Trust in May this year, having worked uh, through the fanzine um, and been part of the combined supporters groups as they were sort of over the last couple of years. You've seen like statements that come out where we're trying to offer the fans like a, a united voice. You know, the the fan base has been not fractured, but there's been some disagreements about the best way about going about things. Um, the trusts have historically not necessarily been seen as uh, as aggressive towards Ron as some people would have liked. So organisations like Save Our South End and previous iterations of protest groups and stuff like that have split up. And so the the, the combined supporters groups was a, as an attempt to sort of get everyone on board and singing from the same hymn sheet. The trust always sort of lurking in the background. They felt like, you know, I'd, I'd been a life member. Oh, Christ knows how long now. Um, well, I got my money's worth, let's put it that way. Um, that makes it sound like I'm terminally ill. But no, I, I've been a life member for for a fair while. That you know, they're they're the natural sort of um, that you know they're inevitably the largest largest organisation. They're probably they're the democratic organisation. They're the seen as the most legitimate organisation. They do have uh, they do have a close relationship with the club, but so should any club have a have a relationship with its supporters trust. Um, and so, as things became more serious and more interventionalist from sort of this time last year where there was that double-headed thing where the trust loaned the club 40 grand last Mm. September to help pay wages, as well as the GoFundMe that was organised by the combined supporters groups, where we had donations from, like, we had American Wrexham fans putting their hands in their pockets to try and pay our players' wages and staff's wages, excuse me. Um, So I had had some involvement with that. I started working with the trust um specifically on that project my missus works in charities so uh had lots of conversations with her about um what can be done with that money what can't be done with that money how are we going to do it you know no no one wanted to give any of that money to ron but we can't put money directly into people's pockets so there's all of those sorts of things so i formed a good relationship with um paul fitzgerald who's the chair um i hope he would agree with that uh and then when the fast forward button was pressed on my involvement was my attendance at the court case in January. So I went as the co-editor of the fanzine. I was confident that there wasn't going to be any local paper coverage. And that's absolutely no shade thrown at Chris Phillips because he does a hell of a job with very not enough hours in the day as far as he's concerned. Um, But I was just confident that the echo was not willing to hold Ron and the club to the required level of scrutiny on on matters like this. So I went in January, uh, I reported on that, and the attention that has come on the club since then has seen uh, 
me have a closer relationship with the trust and then as i say i was i was formally asked i was formally co-opted by them in may um with a view of essentially sort of furthering the possibilities of direct fan involvement in the running of the club um we'd had all sorts of plans uh, earlier on in the year there was sort of phoenix club things being talked about in february and we were looking at what fans might do in order to either prevent that um, you know, we didn't want to give Ron any money again, but we might look to maybe there was a point where we were talking about raising money uh, to purchase like a percentage of the Roots Hall freehold. You know, those sorts of things would have been seen as reasonable. And then we were speaking to other fans trusts about uh, how they got involved in running their club. So there was sort of research being done behind the scenes. And then the board were sort of suitably pleased with all of that and, in, and invited me to join. And uh, And it's been like having a second job ever since. <laughs> Well, great work on the reporting, by the way, because, um, yeah, there is uh, that bit of a disconnect, really, with holding the club to account by the our local uh, newspaper. And Chris does a great job, like you say, down at Roots Hall. But uh, we need to raise that profile, don't we, within the media about what's been going on at South End United, especially with the mainstream media. I mean, when you look at what happened to Berry, for example, it was like it was so late in the day that it started getting reported in the mainstream. So, uh yeah, great effort there, getting into court, making that journey there and, uh, you know, keeping everyone informed. And, uh... Well, that's that's what I sort of saw our role was. You know, I, I sort of, I wrote it up as an away day match report as if it was HMRC away. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was like uh, with, an un, with an undefeated record as yet. Um, but yeah, y- you're right. The profile is there. The media outlets are interested. We've got uh, several people writing articles about us this weekend and we had several people write articles about us in the earlier on in the year including like mainstream newspapers and media outlets and stuff like that. But they're doing it. Uh, they do it. They are doing it very late in the day. They're doing it two weeks before we might go bust. Whereas if the behavior of Ron Martin um, and the sort of lack of consequences that fall on him and the, the actual consequences that fall on the club, the players, the staff, the fans, um, if that was highlighted a little bit more, then the sort of upcoming government legislation to stop people like him running football clubs might have come around a little bit sooner. But, you know, we're, we're grateful. Genuinely, having said all of that, we are grateful for anybody uh, that gives us a chance to talk about the situation the club's in, to go into like genuine detail because it is a complicated situation. Ron has got an enormous web of companies. His son is involved. Uh, there are other people that he's borrowed money off of. Uh, he's got money stored away in the British Virgin Islands. Um, there's, you know, all sorts of people involved. And uh, like, you know, as I say, it's a complex situation. So we, we are grateful, but, um, you know, maybe I'm being uh, unfair. It would have been a bit nicer. Yeah, would have been a bit nicer. We've well, certainly done your due diligence there. I mean, uh, how important are organisations then, like the Shrimpers Trust in holding uh, like all custodians to account? Well, all supporters groups have... The, the duty to inform uh, their peers about what's going on at the club. You know, it's it's one thing to use uh, like fan meetings to talk about sub-selection and transfer policy and stuff like that. And, that, and it, it, in an ideal world, that is what we'd be talking about because we wouldn't be a complete shit show and dumpster fire that we are. Um, but that's why the trust has chosen to maintain uh, a line of dialogue with the club over these years, because Ron Martin does lie and he does lie chronically, but what he'll do is he will tell sort of like 75%, he'll tell so many lies that you can't trust anything, but he will throw a little truth in there. And so what the job is, is, uh, and this is where Paul Fitzgerald has done incredibly well and shown incredible patience on a personal level to maintain that relationship with Ron is um, to keep that dialogue going and to try and make sure that some information can cl- can come from the hierarchy of the club. You look at other organisations, it's only really similar cases to, to us now. I think Ron still takes his calls, but you only have to look at like Blackpool where, you know, they were trying to get games shut down or Coventry or Charlton. Those are where, you know, when, when communication collapses between the fans and the ownership, that's when things are in serious trouble. So, you know, we're 
we're there now really we are we are struggling to sort of get any information out of ron the only he's put two public statements out one was in march to put the club up for sale and one was in it was either end of july or beginning of august whatever it was to say roots all four and a half million quid and there's two and a half million pounds worth of debt of the club and all of whatever that statement was so getting information out of him is very difficult he's hid behind this nda but the the trust's job is is to is to have that scrutiny it's just that ron's business model or ron's running of the club the martin model is death by a thousand cuts so you just sort of you only realize that things are, are quite so serious perhaps when it's too late yeah absolutely i mean you mentioned um other clubs there that have been in a similar situation to us and you know, other trusts at these clubs have been very vocal about our plight, even raising funds at their home games uh, for us. And the football community really does pull together, doesn't it, when uh, clubs are hit with such a crisis? And uh, just how important are these relationships with other trusts? It's been brilliant. We've every single football fan we've spoken to, including from Colu and Orient, and you know, like genuine local rivals. They've, they've all been supportive. There are a couple of Dagenham fans that really hate us. And there was a little bit, which is f- funny. Uh, and there was a little bit of like aggro from Torquay towards the end of last season because they thought they might stay up if, you know, we had a load of points deductions or whatever. But gener- generally speaking, the support, and and as you say, there are people that have put their hand in their pocket here. We've had Wrexham fans last year. We've had York City fans earlier this summer raising money for the hardship fund, including the Wrexham, che- uh, not the Wrexham chairman, sorry, the York chairman, Matt Ugler. He put 10 grand in his, he put yeah. 10 grand in that hardship fund from his own money. Um, it's, it's massive. And that's, and that's beyond what we could hope for or expect because I, I've had other conversations with trusts at Swansea, at Brentford, at, uh, Ch- uh, not Charlton, um, at Chelsea the Chelsea Pitch Owners Association. I spoke to all of these, all of these people in an attempt to look at what might, what the, what might the Shrimpers Trust have as a role going forward with a change of owner. You know, if we can, if we can actually get rid of Ron and get someone in, the trust needs to be able to put a sort of business plan in front of this person's face and say, you know, we can help you if you work with us. We can actually. Um, we can actually grow the club together. We don't have to be at odds. And speaking to these other trusts and having those relationships and being able to learn not just what their successes were, but where their failures were and what they did differently and what they would have done differently if they'd had another go at it has been absolutely brilliant because they're they're very, very candid. And all genuine football supporters, all people want to see is their team play at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and they want opposition to play against. There's no point in, um, you know, hoping that other clubs go under because then who's your team going to play? The support's been unreal. We've been so grateful for everybody that's spoken to us. Oh, no, it's been outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. And collaboration, I feel, was key. And uh, when it has been reported, hasn't it, that um, the trusts have been in communication with Anna Firth, uh, the local MP, the National League, and also the um, prospective new buyer, Justin Rees. And um, how are them talks been? Are you allowed to um, share any detail or have they just been positive or, um, you know, wh- how have they responded to the plight? I think in terms of specific detail, from from what I'm aware of and what I can and can't share, I'll probably err on the side of caution. I would say that Justin comes across as a really nice guy. Um, and I think that the National League have been very, very sympathetic to the situation that the club is in. The National League recognise that the problem is with the owner. I don't think they would say that, but, you know, that sort of reading between the lines in the meeting that we had. Um, and I think they have done they have done their utmost to try and keep the club, to try and retain the integrity of the competition, but to try and keep the club operating and running. They've given, they've pushed deadlines back. They have given us sort of suspended point sentences and stuff like that. And they've, they've done loads. Um, but the, but the key relationship that we've had probably is, is with Anna. Uh, she has been, to be honest with you, I, I am not, uh, my political leanings, is that where well, put it this way? There's only one blue team in my life and in my heart. Um, but she could not really have done much more, uh, as a, as a constituency MP to represent the views of the constituents. The club it, is in her constituency. It's on her side of the boundary to represent the views of the fans in parliament, to, uh, open doors 
which we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. So uh, Fitz went up to meet um, Stuart Andrew, who's the sports minister. He's the guy, he's the point man on the uh, independent regulator plans that the government have got. So he is the minister that, that is responsible for delivering that legislation. So we met him. We've met the civil servants who are working on that policy as well. So we're in dialogue with those guys feeding into what Ron Martin's been up to because Ron Martin's like the poster child of how not to run a football club, right? The, blo- the bloke, you know, the, the, the bloke has made enemies left, right and centre. Um, players don't want to come. Clubs don't want to sell us their players because they don't think they're going to get they don't think they're going to get transfer fees paid. Agents don't want to have their players sign for us because fifteen percent of fuck all isn't going to put food on their table. Um, so, and that's just the in, that's just the industry stuff that, that people that he's upset. HMRC are gunning for him. You know, HMRC know now it's gotten to the point where like he never used to pay his tax. If you if you don't pay your tax bill, right, HMRC sort of like ring you up and they say, oh, sorry, you've probably forgotten. Can you pay us? And then you say, oh, yeah, OK, sorry, I will do. And then if you get that really chronically, they say, OK, well, do you know what? We're going to take you to court. We're going to wind you up if you don't pay. And then some people go, OK, OK, I'll pay. It. And then uh, Ron Martin's gone beyond that. And he says, uh, OK, well, um, I'm not going to pay it. I'll ask for I'll just ask for an adjournment and I'll just kick the can down the road. And then they go. And then eventually the judge goes, you know, you do have to pay these guys because they're the tax man. They're, they're going to come after you. And then uh, he gets probably a couple of adjournments. He goes, no, you really, really do have to pay next time. So he's really upset HMRC. And they just sort of don't go away, HMRC. They're always going to be there. Their, their numbers are generally pretty accurate. So they know what they're they know what they're owed and they're generally pretty good at collecting it. So he's upset them. He's upset the fans. We're at our lowest competitive uh, point in our entire history, having been relegated for the first time ever from the Football League. Um, uh, sorry, I've run out of things. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good relationships. Good relationships. Yeah. Sorry, I beg your pardon. So, you know, Anna, in January, Anna went to bat for Ron and she went to bat for the club. And she wrote a letter to the judge saying, oh, please, you know, grant an adjournment. Please, uh, there's a new stadium coming, blah, blah, blah. All of those sorts of like Ron bullet points, you know, classic stuff where he's just said, you know, go yeah. on, just write this letter and say all this. And she did it. And she sat with HMRC accountants and lawyers and was trying to negotiate a settlement on behalf of the club to try and keep the club going and she did that for six weeks between the middle of january and the beginning of march and then ron paid the bill and then immediately stopped paying hmrc again uh and we another winding up petition uh, petition was issued uh and then another adjournment was sought by ron because he didn't want to pay it and without putting words in Anna's mouth, I think it is fair to say that she was not delighted that all of her endeavours to protect the club and to protect, you know, a piece of the town's cultural heritage were immediately sort of made redundant by Ron just going, ah, oh, yeah, I'll just go back to normal, not pay HMRC. So she joined the trust in April. And she's been a brilliant champion, as I say, sorting these meetings out with sports ministers. We have been liaising with her very closely on this expression of interest, which is yeah. part of our uh, hoped plan to apply for some government funding uh, to purchase Roots Hall uh, or with the aim of purchasing Roots, uh, purchasing Roots Hall. So she's been brilliant and she listens and she sits in these meetings and she helps and she uh, shares information that she has gathered and she opens doors and to be honest with you i could not really have asked for much more of her it's all gone on behind the scenes but she's been great and, and of course that's what you expect from your local mp isn't it and uh, to have that representation in parliament and uh, and that help and well you mentioned there about government funding and um could you explain to the listeners do you know the, any details of what what the uh, application for the community funding from the uh, is it the department for leveling up housing and communities that's it. Yeah. So that's Michael Goh's department. So we were we've, we've been looking at lots of things that we can do as this sale has gone on. One of the things that the fans struggle with is any upfront cash to buy the club. You know, Ron Ron put out this statement in in the summer and said, oh, you know, new terms. Here's what the terms are. And he put a price label on various things. Now, we don't have like 10 million pounds like lying about. But what the fans can do is they can generate 10 million pounds over two years at a push, five years, 10 years, 15 years, something like that. You know, there is an ongoing commitment for us 
but not just uh you know there's an ongoing commitment for us and and in some cases like residents of the town i've had mates of mine who say i support arsenal but i've joined the trust because i don't want to see the club go under because i recognize it's an important part of the town so the uh community ownership fund is a mechanism that we as the board and the working group sort of within within the within the membership have felt is the right mechanism for us to get a foot in the door in in South and United as a as a going concern. So the community ownership fund is a as you say it's a, it's essentially a 150 million pound fund which is granted out to various organizations upon application. Um and the most sort of appropriate football example would be Berry. The Berry Supporters Society were able to successfully apply to the community ownership fund. They received a 1 million pound grant. And they were able to use that in, and it was, it had to be match funded. So they had to generate, they had to raise a million pounds themselves in order to get the million from the government. And they were able to use that to purchase Gig Lane. And so we've seen the Phoenix Club, AFC Berry, now combine with Berry FC. And that one club is now playing at Gig Lane again. So that was a really inspirational story for us, not from like a sort of Phoenix perspective, but in terms of like what they were able to do and the mechanisms they were able to pull. So we put an expression of interest in, which is the initial sort of, uh, you know, stages of an application to say, we think we would be a suitable candidate for this money. Here's the sort of project we're talking about. Here's, Here's the problem. Here's what we would do with it. Here's how much money we would need. Uh, and we've sent that off to um, to DLUC, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. So they've confirmed they've received it, and we're hoping for we're hoping essentially for them to review that and invite us to submit a full bid before the window for the, or the funding window mm-hmm. closes on. I think it's the 11th of October. So what we would need to do is we'd need to be invited to bid, and then we would need to uh, put a sufficiently robust document together essentially like a business plan of like what are we going to do with all of this money if we if the if um if the leveling if the community ownership fund comes in our direction what are we going to do with it and how is that going to benefit the town so we are we are hopeful that the berry uh situation acts as a precedent for us and we are hopeful that, that we will we will be offered an invite to bid and we're sort of getting a lot of our ducks in a row to be prepared to do that. I don't think that there was, we consulted with the board. It was really important to have this sort of discussed democratically by those elected to the trust board. And we looked at the possibility of purchasing the club, Ron, there's a lot of debt. And as I say, we could get out of that debt. We could, we, we, I, my personal feeling is that, you know, we could, we could negotiate new payment terms just by not just by anyone except Ron Martin sitting over the negotiating table on South and United's behalf. You suddenly get an individual who you owe money to or the club owes money to, but they're much more likely to be uh, open and amenable to a, a different payment plan if Ron Martin isn't the one sat there. So it's a lot of debt. But the thing that really scared us off, I think, was the operating deficit. So the club famously, I think the figure a couple of years ago was like about £100,000 a month, which is £1.2 million a year. And that is, that's that's like operating losses, right? That's revenue, less costs, and you're in the hole hundred grand every month. And I do not think that there is the appetite that as things stand, I don't think there's an appetite for for fans to take on even if it does cost a quid to take on two and a half million pounds worth of debt and a hundred thousand pound a month black hole a month and that's and that was when we were in the football league do you know what i mean so the community ownership fund was a way for us to look at okay well what can we do well ron martin is a property developer his whole play from day one has been to move the club to a new stadium and to redevelop roots hall and we've seen other owners do that uh, Mel Morris did that at Derby, sold Pride Park to himself and leased it back. And that's, you know, there there will be three or four other examples of people that have done that, but that's the sort of main sort of nationally known one that comes to mind. Um, and what's the solution to that? Well, the solution to that is that the fans like l- legally own the freehold and the stadium because 
the club can sell itself to its, you know, to its owner or whatever. The club can sell its assets to its owner, excuse me. But if, and the fans built Roots Hall, right? In the 50s, we are, we are living descendants, not me, but we are living descendants of the people that, that laid the concrete and painted the seats and did all of that stuff and built Roots Hall. We have like, you know, it's, it's a fair point to say we've got a birthright to own that stadium. It was built by the fans and it was given to the club and Ron Martin took it for himself and he did it under the justification, his own justification that he needed for, he needed to inject four million pounds into the club to save it from the financial situation that Vic Jobson had left it in. Mm. And he said that and everyone believed it because of the situation that Vic Jobson had left it, left us in. But so yeah, sorry, I was going to say, oh, go on. but it didn't, but he didn't need to do that. Yeah. And so I think an attempt to wrestle the stadium away from the club and to put it in the ownership of the fans, to have the fans as guardians of the club so that it cannot be milked for its assets and it cannot be turned over and it cannot be exploited in that same way. There, There is a level of protection over that. I think that was seen as our best uh, option, essentially, especially because it's, you know, there are no sort of ongoing costs, hopefully. Well, that, there we are. That's, well, that sounds like a huge piece of work. And um, it, yeah, it is. It's been it's been an absolute nightmare, Paul. Yeah. Been, <laughs> I've worked with I and uh, about half a dozen of us have worked our nuts off for six months just to try and get into a situation where we felt it was like a viable option. Mm. The tectonic plate shift. Every time Ron opens his mouth or another rumour turns up on Trimper Zone about who's going to buy the club or whatever, it it's massive. And we're genuinely not expectant, but we're genuinely hopeful that we can get something across the line here. Well, we've all got our fingers and toes crossed for that because um, that would be the dream. I mean, like you say, Roots Hall built by the fans, for the fans, for the town, for the club. And, you know, Ron can't pull off his 25-year dream then, can he, of developing Ross Fossett's farm? Because if we stay at Roots Hall, you know, that was part of the deal, wasn't it? So, you know, without a new stadium, there's no new development. If, um, you know, we stay there, because I thought Roots Hall was a key part for that, wasn't it? So, that, yeah, there's a protective covenant on Roots Hall, which was uh, an arrangement entered into between the council and the football club. Oh, is that right? I don't know. There's all sorts of legal... Le- excuse me there's all sorts of legal stuff because it's a 70 year old document but essentially the council agreed that roots hall and its land and all of that could not be redeveloped until a new stadium had been built for south end united and that is sort of that was part of the gift i think between the fans and the club all those years ago and it's such a wonderfully elegant and crafted piece of work to protect the club because that uh, protective covenant is is the reason that Ron has not put the club into administration it's the reason that Ron has not liquidated the club and just built over it in the first place because he knows that he will not get permission if he runs the club into the ground the council will not give him permission to to build anything in that town uh, and rightly so the 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 plan at the moment the plan he he has permission to build a 21,000 currently there's permission to build a 21,000 seater stadium with a housing estate adjacent to it and to build all the sort of training complex and he has permission to build all of the you know do you remember when he bought the David Beckham soccer dome oh it's still there isn't it rusting away yeah, it's just rusting away at boots and yeah. so he's done all of this he's got permission to build all of that and he's got and he's uh got permission to build uh, flats on a redeveloped Roots Hall. But he does not have, I think you you got this out of Matt Dent, didn't you? Because he does not have permission to build the houses until he's built the ground. The ground must come first. Yes. And so it's essentially he's got nothing. And there's a genuine situation here where if he'd have put the club, when he put the club up for sale, if he'd have sold it within two months, this, what I'm about to say, wouldn't be the sort of topic of conversation we're having right because we'd have had a transfer window over the summer and you know we'd be in sixth position or higher as we would have been if we hadn't had a points deduction right but he can't even fucking what's the swearing situation by the way on this podcast so i would try and edit it out but uh... okay sorry (laughs) um 
but he can't even he can't even sell the club properly. He is so inept. His selfishness overcomes his own ability to just do achieve anything. He's not built anything. And now the fans are, you know, not unreasonably threatening him and his family with blocking any and all applications that he tries to have in South End because no no one wants him to do this. He has mm. been chairman of South End for so long that a, an entire new generation of uh, city councillors and fans and you know all of these people who do not have like old relationships with Ron where you go oh I remember the good old days we're in the championship well no a lot of them don't a lot of them don't a lot of them have uh, a lot of them have come to south end to further their political career and they're not interested in knowing Ron from 25 years ago they're interested in a bloke that has been talking for a quarter of a century about building something at Fossett's farm and achieving absolutely f all so um it's uh the, the the protective covenant is a really complex legal situation. And I, I don't know what will happen with Fossets. I, I have a feeling that there's now enough willpower in the fan base to, to stop anything happening there. There's talk at the moment about the prospe- Justin Reese released a statement earlier this week saying, oh, well, redeveloping Roots Hall would actually be our plan A at this point for him and his consortium, which is music to the fans ears, because as I said before, you know, we have like a real affinity with that stadium and it is a proper like football ground. Do you know what I mean? It's not a, it's not a new identikit bowl like Southampton or Leicester or any, or, or Derby or any of these like really like sort of yeah. one tier, you know, they're very good facilities and all of that, but they're a bit soulless. Um, you know, Roots Hall is a, is a real football ground. You know, it's like when people had it, have a go at uh, Luton being in the Premier League and everyone's slagging off Kenilworth Road. And I, I remember thinking, that's what a real football ground looks like, you fi- you idiots, you Philistines. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, you know, that's that's a really good possibility for us to, to get that redeveloped. Um, but then that leaves Ron with, what's he going to do with Fossets? There's so many, like, ifs, buts and maybes in all of this. It's really difficult to know what's going to happen next. Well, you touched on there Justin Reese's um, statement that he put out. It was nice to have a bit of a, a, you know, communication from a prospective owner. I mean, what are the trust thoughts on that statement? I can't speak on behalf of the whole trust, but I think it was a positive, based on the conversations that we've had with him, it was a positive and fairly, and, and, ref, and um, sorry, it was a positive and fair reflection of the situation with negotiations between Justin and Ron. I think the only bone of contention that we had was there was some phrasing he used towards the end of the statement about, he said, the plans to stay at, he said something like the plans to stay at Root Hall, Root Hall and the structure of the bid have blah, 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 have been fully endorsed by Anna, the council. And then he included the Shrimpers Trust in that. And I think that there was some, reservation in the trust being entirely happy with their name being lumped in there because we don't know who his consortium is made up of we are told i I do i do not believe for one second he's lied to us but he's kept the information private and that's entirely his prerogative but we do not know we do not know how much money he's got, how much money he's personally got. We do not know how much money his backers have got. We haven't seen a source of funds. We haven't seen anything like that. And also, you know, and that, and again, that's entirely fair. That's his business. He is not, he doesn't, he's not buying it from us. He doesn't need to show us any of that information. He needs to show it to Ron. But the suggestion that we were wholly in favor of his proposal was uh, presumptive is, is, is probably where, we, what we landed on. Um, I think there was an appetite to stay at Roots Hall. And I think we would like to know more about what the bid structure is going to be. And we've had some, um, and we've had enough conversations with Justin to feel that he has looked at lots of different angles here. He is aware that administration is a possibility. He has a background of working in the UK, uh, not for all of his life, but for some time. Uh, He seems like a really passionate bloke. He seems like a really intelligent bloke, but that uh, that was something that sort of stuck in our collective craws a little bit. Otherwise, it seemed entirely fair. And as you say, Paul, it was it was welcome to hear something from someone yeah. because, you know, Ron is hidden behind an NDA and he's forced other interested parties to hide behind NDAs. The only time, the only other people we've heard from are Kimura when Ron suggested they don't have the money. And uh, guess what? If you suggest uh, a 
private uh, if you suggest that a financial services firm based in the city of london doesn't have the required money they're probably going to defend themselves and the only other person we've heard from was tara brady who said yeah i sent him a whatsapp but uh, ron never got back to me so there's not been guess what no one's beating down their door to spend 10 million pounds on a football club at the bottom of the national league from ron effing martin uh, sorry it's so hard i know you want to cut that out but it's no, I, so I'll hard share your passion i share your passion Liam. It, it is uh you know it's frustrating isn't it i mean we, we're steamrolling towards the 4th of october we're running out of time so what do you think the likeliest outcome is going to be come 4th of october i um your listeners won't be able to see this but i had to like cover my eyes as, as you said that to me uh i have i have no i genuinely have no idea I genuinely have no idea. Uh, he, the sort of, the rumoured amount is about 100, and, or the talked about amount owed to HMRC is £175,000. That is not the biggest amount of money he's ever had to pay to HMRC. There were other creditors that joined the petition, one of which was NPower. So uh, one of which was PG Site Services, one of which was NPower, and the other one was a legal firm who he had not paid either so the situation is this uh he had come to an arrangement with n power and with pg site services and those creditors at the previous hearing dropped off the petition or in fact it might have been the previous hearing but one that might have been in may where they dropped off the petition so n power said we don't want to be part of this petition anymore you guys go on ahead but we're not going to do it i'm not sure about the legal firm but hmrc are, are still trying to wind us up um so he he is my firm belief, and I have no way of backing this up, but he's got British Virgin Island money, right? He's got Caribbean tax haven money. Uh, and he's got that because, and I can say this freely because his treatment of HMRC is another like classic symptom of this because he just does not believe that the rules apply to him. He thinks that the rest of us should pay tax and he shouldn't have to. He thinks that the rest of us should pay for hospitals and he shouldn't have to. And he thinks the rest of us should pay for the police and for nurses and for the armed forces and all of those things that tax money goes towards. And he thinks that he shouldn't have to do it. He does not feel like it is a requisite of him to contribute to society. He believes he can take from society for his own benefit and his family's benefit. So he's got tax haven money and he can afford one hundred seventy-five thousand pounds. It's my firm belief. I can't back that up because the I, the possibility of getting a paper trail from the the government of the British Virgin Islands is nigh on impossible. But it's my firm belief that that's the case. So he can pay it, and he chooses not to. And he chooses not to pay his staff. And he chooses to do all of things. All of these things. He chooses to put fuel in a helicopter with a South and United badge on it, so that his son can be helicoptered into his own wedding. And he chooses not to pay his staff doing that at the same time, right? These are all choices that he makes. And he goes to sleep at night, or he tries to, or you have to hope that he you have to hope that he's having some sort of moral quandary about all of it. So in terms of an outcome, but he, he chooses not to rescue the football club. In terms of an outcome, I genuinely have no idea. I would say liquidation is a serious possibility. But then you only have to look at what happened with Steve Dale at Berry and say. Uh, what what happened there was, you know, he was holding out for a bigger bid that never came. And then HMRC, <laughs> really didn't put them into administration because he thought it wouldn't happen to him. And then they got liquidated. So that's, uh, it's a serious, it's a serious possibility, at which point the club ceases to exist. No more. <laughs> Done. Finished. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's genuinely on the table here. Mm-hmm. I do not, I do not think that Justin Reese is going to pay Ron's bills. And I have to say, fair play to him because I do not think he should I do not think the fans should do it I do not because and I and I also I do not think like anyone should do it I don't think anybody should be trying to pay Ron's bills to keep the club going at this point because that man will be and should be tainted with the failure of this club that should follow him around forever oh a hundred percent. Yeah, this is all of his doing I mean you talked about choices there not paying staff and you know, the you talked to touched on it earlier on as we started because the the trust did make a substantial um, contribution, didn't they, to, to paying wages? And um, for those of our listeners that don't know, could you just like, um, tell us a little bit about that? 
So this was um, about this time last year. We've been in an, a transfer embargo for probably, I think it was confirmed at the end of September last year. That was when all of these financial situations, we'd had various transfer embargoes, but like staff stopped getting paid in like September, October last year. And the trust chose to make a donation of 40, a loan, sorry, a loan, very important distinction. <laughs> the trust loaned the club £40,000 to try and keep, the staff salaries going and I think that it's that you know I, I wasn't I was a member members were not consulted on that loan and uh I was not a board member at that time so I can't speak about the discussions that were had they were they would have been had I'm certain of it they would have there would not have been anybody taking money from the trust and dumping it in the club's bank account it wouldn't have been like that that's not how they work I can comfortably say that but I think that where we were then and where we are now in terms of like the long-term choices not to pay the staff wages because he felt he didn't need to. Uh, we That's not the position that the trust was in in September, October last year. I My feeling is that the trust made the right call at the right time. The cost of living crisis was really biting everyone price of petrol price of goods at the supermarket was going up and we were coming up to christmas winter you remember all the fuel bills were well they're yeah. still massive now but they yeah. were they were coming in like thousands of pounds uh a year hundreds of pounds a month increasing by hundreds of pounds a month for plenty of people and the trust made the decision to protect the staff because ron wasn't going to do it and they did it they did if they if they did it today i think they would or we now sorry i think we would cop a lot of flack but i don't think we do it today because for the for the everything i've just said about propping up a failing organization i don't think there's any appetite to do that because we know that the club is a black hole but we didn't know that then no one knew that then that was why the go the go fund me money was raised because we wanted the staff to not be suffering from not being paid but to be especially exploited at christmas especially at christmas to be exploited because yeah. they love the club and they work for the club and they want the club to succeed. And and their owner, their boss, is choosing not to pay them and is choosing to exploit their goodwill and their labour. It's outrageous. And I think that the trust made the right decision at the right time. And it's only... It, hindsight is twenty twenty, but would would you... Would you ch if, if you could go back in time, you'd change that because you, you'd know it... It, it might have made a difference or sorry if you no, that's impossible to say uh i think they did the right thing at the right time yeah i think they did as well absolutely there's a lot of staff there going unpaid a lot of uncertainty and i think the trust did the right thing stepped in at the time like you say cost of living crisis christmas was coming they've got bills to pay they had family that dependence and you're right it's not fair that one man chooses not to pay his staff um, just because he didn't want to and and refused to it's a uh, it's outrageous, but um... I think there, I think there was a bit of flat because it was undemocratic, and I and I do accept that, and I think perhaps the membership should have been consulted because it was a serious amount of money. And Ron, despite as I say the situation being different now to twelve months ago, Ron is known as someone who is, uh, you know, not fiscally stable, right? So so that context was there, and I think there's a I think there's a fair criticism to be leveled at the board that said you should have consulted members for such a large amount of money you could have quite easily said this is what we propose to do do you support it or not and i think they could have done that but i think the i absolutely think the heart was in the right place and i think they they made the right call to the best of their ability and if you ask individual board members would they have, would they do it differently i'd be very surprised if anyone says yes so if we get to the fourth and that's it, the the club folds. Uh, have has the trust been in contact with um, like the council or any other stakeholders with regards to the formation of a Phoenix club? Uh, yes, there are some very light. I would not say there are any robust uh, contingency plans there. There is a there is an emergency document that we would we would release. I think the situation at first as much as anything requires some breathing room uh we've spoken to the council about what could be done uh the council have said you know if it was a phoenix situation that they would 
be able to essentially offer more interventionalist support and actually support us in uh, ascending up the leagues quite as quickly as we might hope, uh, which was really positive to hear. I think that um, there, there was lots to talk about this last year and it was a really difficult time to talk about it because you need to like register for a competition by a certain point so we didn't know if we were going to if we needed a phoenix club in march we didn't know whether we were going to apply to like the isthmian south southern or whether we we're going to end up in the essex senior league we didn't know what we were going to do and then we missed the registration deadline and all of those sorts of things so i think if if the worst comes to the worst on the 4th of october i think the first thing to do is to stop and breathe and to not to try to to try to unite the fan base and to try and avoid a Berry situation where someone goes too soon and yeah. then you end up with two football clubs. So I think the first thing will be essentially because and there's lots of people that have expressed an opinion which is that they don't they don't want to be part of a Phoenix club and I totally respect that and that they you know they would just stop following football or they'd become a sort of general casual football fan. And I totally understand that, um, but I think the first thing would be to just take a breath because it has been a very, very, very intense period, especially over the, like the last five years, I would say sort of since Chris Powell got sacked, that sort of, that run of injuries, it has been just non-stop drama. Uh, and it's tight. It's really tight. So I think the first thing would be to take a breath. There's, there's plans in place. There are companies that have been registered as backups you know, for all of these sorts of things. And there's contingencies ready to go. But I think that nothing would happen without the consent of the fans. And the trust role in that would be enormous to try and unite the fan base, the fan base that want to be part of it. And that's, as I would say, that's fair enough. Uh, um, and then I think we would look to press on because a city of South End should have a football club there and it should have a successful football club and it should have a football club in the Football League. And, oh, I, and I, yeah. people want that. and there should be 117 years ago that was what people wanted to work towards and i see no reason why if this iteration were to die in october we shouldn't try that again oh i agree and uh, i don't know if you saw our interview with matt dent he was uh, saying the similar things that you know to get the a club running up and running and have it run properly and uh get back up those leagues and start you know winning trophies again and you know, make sure it isn't run by um, a horrible individual. But um, you, you, you release the Martin. Oh, God, sorry. I beg your pardon. Well, you, you, you can do that when you have a democratically run organisation behind it. And some of the, when you talked earlier about speaking to other fans' organisations, what we found was the fans that have had the most input into how their club is run have been able to do that through insolvency events right whether that's administration or liquidation so the fans have often been the one to step in and purchase the club exeter city a great example of this they were celebrating 20 years of being fan owned uh this last month and they are towards the top of league one so it can be done um and the other thing that that happens the other thing that happens with that is that should the trust choose to relinquish control of the club they have the ability to say yes or no to the people that want to buy it so we saw that quite famously in the Wrexham documentary with um the guys from Hollywood coming over the trust was in control of Wrexham they could have very easily said no sorry we just don't think you're right for us that's fine and similarly with um Brentford Matthew is it Bannon Bannon Brannon good question uh, yeah, the guy so. the guy that owns Brentford is a Brentford fan and he yeah. bought it from the Brentford Trust. So one of the reasons we were so keen to speak to them is they have a golden share model, which allows the fans essentially like certain powers of veto over what the club wants to do. And and this, per, this perfect example, when I spoke to the chairman of Bees United, he said, look, we, we, had pa we had a power of veto over the club moving to a new stadium that did not have a capacity of X. And the chairman wanted to build a stadium with a capacity that was lower than the required thing for them to put the veto in. And he said, look, I know you've got this veto, but I want to build a stadium that's slightly smaller. And here's the reasons why. But the th the key and they and they accepted it and they didn't use the power of veto. But all of that was about dialogue. All of that was about collaborative working. And you can have successful football clubs where fans and owners work together hand in hand. But you will not do that with someone like Ron, who wants it all his own way. Well, the club, uh, sorry, the trust came up, uh, released the Martin model, uh, which was uh, quite impressive. And uh, what would you like to see 
we, well, would you like to see some form of legislation and based on that in place to prevent other poor custodians owning football clubs? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that when the white paper, the government published a white paper, I think in like January or February this year, which was the uh, essentially it's sort of like a statement of intent for the government to pass legislation. And it was based on the fan led review that was run by Tracy Crouch, who used to be the sports minister, or she might have been the, the, the sort of over minister, the secretary of state for culture, media and sport, but she was certainly involved in in that sort of stuff. Uh, she's a Tottenham fan that lives in Gillingham and they've had all sorts of trouble over the years uh, in, in this respect. So she understands a thing or two about a thing or two. She's very passionate. and She led a good review uh, and the government produced a white paper with some very robust suggestions of what might make it into legislation. And there's loads of stuff about um, or what, well, there's like there's loads of stuff and people can read it. And there's there's all sorts of like ideas about regulation about money filtering down the pyramid we had loads of media conversations with journalists at that point in the year who were asking us well don't you just need more money from the premier league well actually no what we want is a more we need a more stable um sort of uh we need a more stable environment in which for us to be able to uh, a stable ecosystem for us to be able to climb the leagues on our own merits um, you only have to look at Luton as an example of a club that is just not absolutely mad to fly through the leagues and just with a bit of a stable idea and, and following it through. So, <clears throat> so I'd love to see some legislation passed. I think one of the most interesting things that was proposed in the white paper was the idea of licensing for club owners and directors. So there's been a lot of flack for uh, the Football League and the Premier League for the 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 lack of strength in the owners, the the fit and proper persons test, which is when someone wants to buy a football club, they are put through, they are asked these various conditions. And then if they fail any of them, they're not allowed to buy a football club. But one of those things is like, have you ever been, uh, um, it's something like, have you ever been disqualified as a director of a football club before twice? And obviously no one ticks now. It's a very, very weak bit of uh, governance from from the governing bodies. And also the other thing is that the Premier League is essentially just a collection of its own clubs. So if someone walks in and says, I want to buy Wolverhampton Wanderers and all my money is in cryptocurrency, then the other 19 Premier League owners are going to go, yeah, by all means, by all means, take control of Wolverhampton Wanderers because they're not us. And you'll be out of the Premier League and you're not going to be a threat to us. So it's in it's in the club's interests to allow these like nut jobs to come in and bad owners to buy football clubs that aren't their own. Um, so the club, so the fit, a, a more robust fit and proper owners test was a very interesting part of this leg, this proposed legislation. But the other thing was the, the licensing. So that is essentially a sort of annual fit and proper owners test uh, whereby clubs and more importantly their directors would have to provide the independent regulator with a business plan to say how much revenue you're going to bring in what's your spending going to be where is this operating loss so the idea of our operating deficit of a hundred thousand pounds a month it just wouldn't be allowed because that is the martin model and that is the exact sort of thing that needs to be completely expunged from the, the entire pyramid you can't allow these cowboys running football clubs anymore so i'd i'd love to see it it's been it's been years that we have allowed rich people to do whatever they want with cultural assets in in all aspects of the uk yeah. and um this is a really really welcome prospect of legislation to say you can't do it anymore because it means too much to too many people that it's not your toy so yeah. i'd love it oh well that's it Absolutely. And uh, well, I think there's going to be all eyes on us in the next couple of weeks, seeing how this pans out and, you know, anything that can help raise the profile and that deterrent and then it needs to be documented. And it's nice that we are seeing this now kind of creeping into the mainstream media as well. And yeah, we can't have these people anywhere near football, really, because uh, they're not football people, are they? It's not good for our mental health, is it? I mean, no, like no, how much how much stress? How, how much have you been put through the ringer, especially in the last nine months? But like I say, it's been gone. It's gone back for a long time. Mm. Like long it's time. just it's mm. just dreadful. It can't, That's you it. know, yeah. it, it, three o'clock on a Saturday should be an escape. Yeah, I know. 
And we used to go to the games, didn't we? I mean, like you say, since Chris Powell, when he was when all them injuries, we used to go to Roots all going, how many are we going to lose by today? You know, that that was it. You know, what was going to happen? And then when Kevin came in, we got to get a bit, a bit of hope. I mean, the recruitment there was fantastic. But then, like you say, it's just been stopped. You know, we can't sign anyone. We can't do anything. We can't buy anything. You know, the lights are getting turned off soon. You know, it's it's yeah. a shambles, absolute shambles. And like you say, it's, it should be a release for us to go there, football, three o'clock, Tuesday night, Friday night. And, see your mates. Uh, see your mates <laughs> you know and cheer on the team. Yeah. yeah. And we yeah. can't do it. And it's all because of one man. And it ain't just just for just because you mentioned his name, it ain't Kev. <laughs> Yeah, we are. Yeah. But um, well, I noticed as well. Uh, I'm a member of the Shrimpers Trust, and I know if you like you mentioned earlier, you've got friends who aren't even South End fans, mine included as well, have signed up just to support the club, support that local football club because they see the importance of it. So um, the trust he's seen a spike in membership, hasn't it? Um, in the last weeks. Yeah, we were on about eight hundred odd. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. So the, the the first sort of spike that we saw was after the council meeting uh, where there was some ideas floated about direct intervention. So Matt Dent, who you, did you have him on after that council meeting or did you have him on before? Yes, yes. Yeah, we got him on straight after, yeah. Yeah, so essentially in, in the immediate days after that, there were a couple of councillors that suggested in, in that meeting that, um, s- that uh, Lydia Hyde suggested that the club should be bought by the council and then sold, or the, the stadium, excuse me, she should, she suggested that Roots Hall should be bought by the council and then sold back to the fans. And Ron Woodley suggested that the trust should be loaned £2 million. Um, I don't know if he actually had any specific reason because I think the meeting was cut short at that point because there were so many <laughs> so many councillors talking about spending millions and millions of pounds. Um, so the meet, I think they had an adjournment at that point and they, and they had a few discussions behind closed doors. But... Um, so we had a spike in membership at that point because it was, you know, when, when someone talks about giving a fans organization 2 million quid, people mm. want to have a say in where that goes. And so they should. And all of those members are welcome to join for whatever reason they want, really. And that was an entirely valid reason to to, to lend your voice to an organization. That's what we're here for. And, and, and since the uh, expression of interest went in, which I think we announced on Tuesday morning we've had another spike we've had another sort of uh big uptick in in people that are interested and have joined and have put their hand in their pocket and we're very very grateful for everybody that's done that as well we were on about 800 odd as I say before that council meeting we're now over 1200 wow um we are in a position where uh uh, Paul Yeomanson, who is our deputy chair and membership secretary, is literally not able to process these membership applications fast enough for us to be able to keep count. He has a full time job and he is used to doing sort of two of these a month. Uh, and and uh, he has been inundated, doesn't cover it. You know, we're, we're getting like dozens, dozens in hours hundreds a day on on early, in the earlier part of this week it's been absolutely brilliant to see so I, I did ask him this morning but he says he can't give me a specific figure um but uh yeah it's been it's been great and it's exactly what it's exactly sort of it's sort of uh symptomatic not symptomatic it's sort of um a fantastic example of what people from south end are like which is that when the chips are down they step up you know, this the club is at its lowest competitive ebb. The club may well not exist in the next two weeks or whatever it is, two and a half weeks. And people still want to lend their voice and people still want to be part of the conversation. People still want to be involved. No one's running away. People are, people are you know, doing the right thing here. And it's like, it's so humbling. Because I, I haven't lived in South End for like 10 years. I live in Brighton. And... um I but I have I still have this like South I grew up in South End. I have this really in, innate close connection with that town, with that city. And I love it. And you see people that they're not shirking. They're stepping up, man. They they got a bit of responsibility. They're doing more than what Ron Martin's doing. Mm-hmm. And it's great because we can't as an organization, we can't claim to represent the voices of people that aren't part of it. We want as many people to join as possible. We want as many people to become part of the conversation as possible, because if the fans are to communicate their thoughts and feelings, they need a conduit to do it. And the trust is the natural sort of the natural way to do that. 
We've actually, as well as a membership drive this week, we've launched a uh, we've launched a fan engagement survey, which is looking at the possibility of um, essentially just trying to sort of ascertain what the uh, financial potential of the fan base is. So we've talked about um, earlier, like not having any upfront cash. We don't have 10 million lying around, but we can raise money over time. We've put a survey out. We've been working with uh, a fan engagement specialist who's a fan of the club and has been brilliant in supporting us to do this. And we put a fan engagement survey and we absolutely encourage everybody listening to this to complete it, to really consider it, to really think about their answers, because we're looking at ways, you know, the, the data that it will give us is what we are going to be able to present to people if we want to seriously have a material input into what's going on at the club it's going to be able to give us the answers to say well here's what we think we can do here's we can put our money where our mouth is and we can do that to the tune of such, such and such um so the spike has been brilliant the membership has been brilliant and we hope that those people are happy with what we've been doing and hope those people are happy with the sorts of things that i've said this evening but the survey if i can encourage one thing for your listeners to actively if i can plug if i may yeah, absolutely go for it yeah, uh, yeah. If you can find, if you can get hold of the survey, it's on the Shrimpers Trust website. If you can get in board, and if you're already a member and you're listening to this, you should have an email arrive uh, in your inbox this evening. Check your spam folders, check your junk folders, please fill that out because that's going to give us the information that we need to start approaching people and to be taken seriously as a financial entity in terms of you know what what can the fan base contribute here. Um, it's it's been it's been really as i say it's been really really humbling to see people take such an interest in terms of membership in terms of wanting to be part of something in terms of recognizing what value the trust has because i i i've been a life member for years but the trust to me was always like it's like being part of a union i work in i work in a factory and i've been a union member for 6 or 7 years now and i look at being a union member as sort of insurance against having a bad boss so the the fan the the trust and all supporters trusts are essentially just fans unions they're a way for individual people who don't necessarily have a say in the situation they're in because it's bigger than them to pull together and to and to have a little bit of influence and a bit of collective bargaining and a bit of negotiation and a bit of buy-in and all of these sorts of things so i think i think it's really really important and that's why i was that's why i was a life member so early on because i i see the value in it you and me both and you you've just taken the words right out of my mouth i was going to say oh, just like being in a union well you're quite right you're quite right as well these trade unions are there to protect our rights uh in the workplace and trust should be there to protect our football clubs and uh and our right to go and watch football and enjoy it a Saturday afternoon, Tuesday night and Friday night and the club and its staff and its playing staff and its non-playing staff and its academy and the city. And yes, um, everyone who's uh, listening into this as well, please uh, go onto the socials. It's shrimperstrust.co.uk. Uh, if you want to sign up, I encourage everyone to do so. They're, they're all over social media, just uh, on Twitter at Shrimpers Trust. And of course, Facebook and everywhere else. We will also retweet on our socials. So get us on the uh, at Shrimpers cast across the whole lot. We will get all of that out. And I've just been on your Twitter to get your handle there just to make sure I've got it right. And the, the tweet is out. So get on that. Go and take part of this survey. It is incredibly, incredibly important. Because that was going to be my next question anyway. What can the fans do? So there you go. Get on it. Get it done. Absolutely. So, well... That has been an amazing hour and a half chat there, Liam. It's been, um, thank you so much. It's been a great insight into the work that the trust do and the incredible work that they've been doing and continue to do as well. And um, I can and only apologise. It's not been much of a chat. It's been mostly me just um, no, it's going been brilliant. on. So, so I can only apologise no. if I've bored everyone stiff. No, this is what we, uh, we, we want. This is what we've been wanting to hear as well. Because we, like you say, transparency from... The club itself and the executive up there is uh, non-existent. So a lot of us, we don't know what's going on. You know, we're hearing little snippets here and there and just kind of joining the dots through social media and what has been put on Trim Trust. And it's and it's great to hear people like Mac Den and yourself coming forward and just giving our, giving our fans, us, you know, the people of South End, this, you know, the clarity, letting us know what is going on because uh, time is ticking. 
we might not have a club, but now, you know, there are things in place. It's great to hear all of the good work that you and the trust have been doing. It's fantastic. I promise, I promise you, Paul, and I promise the listeners that, you know, we have been working on this for a long time. We, we, f- we feel that the community ownership fund is a genuinely viable outcome for us. Like I said, like I said earlier, we're not expectant, but we are genuinely hopeful. Very supporters society being able to successfully apply for that money and then acquire gig lane is, is such a massive precedent for us. And we genuinely believe that this is a vehicle or this is a, a mechanism that's going to, that's going to suit the trust and the sustainable long-term future of South and United, if it gets if it gets past the fourth of October, so we we I know that I know that a lot of things have been kept quiet, and I know that do you know announcing this sort of like two weeks before a court hearing is not brilliant, but we did want to give a fair amount of time for buyers to come forward and try and take the club off Ron's hands. We did not want to be seen to be like getting in the way of something. We did not want to be seen to complicate things. But when Ron put a price a uh, when Ron slapped a price tag on Roots Hall in the summer, the game changed because he said he said the stadium and the land cost 4.5 million and suddenly it's game on. So we have been working really hard, but but we you know we can't we have to pull the trigger at the right time and hopefully we've done it. Or hopefully and hopefully we will get it over the line. Well if we have Roots Hall, we have a base, we have that foundation, don't we? And then Southend can continue to have a football club, whether it'll be as it is now or as a Phoenix club. I mean, uh, and I'm pretty sure even if we were in the Ishmael League or the Thurlow Nunn Prem, wherever we may end up with the stadium, it is going to be, we will have four, five, six thousand there every game and it won't be long before we uh, screen back up the leagues. If I we, thought you were going to say four, five, six sides then and I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd be interesting development. I'll yeah. pull that Let's have a seven-sided Roots Hall. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be interesting. But um, fantastic stuff, Liam. And well, we'd like to stay in touch with you and uh, as things develop, um, you never know, we might be taken over, things might change. You know, it's a, it's a very... It's a fast moving kind of thing going on here, but um, brilliant to have you on. It's been fantastic talking to you tonight and I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Yep. Join up, do the survey. Uh, Thanks everyone for listening. Absolutely. Up the blues. Here we go. Up the blues. Cheers, mate. (laughs) 